Um, again, just introducing myself. Uh, again, my name is Dave Fad. My Mohawk name is uh, Ganyet Tegel. And uh, Ganyet Tegel in English translates to patches of snow. Uh, and I was born the Ides of March, March 15th. And my great grandmother on my mom's side gave me that name. She was still alive. And it's that time of year the snow starts to melt when you have patches of snow on the ground. And so there was an old name that fit that particular circumstance. And I often wonder why I got that name. Because here in March, you still have 10 foot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> but when I moved to Akwazasli, where my family's from, right along the same beautiful St. Lawrence River, I remember the first birthday I had up there, there was patches of snow on the ground. And so it made sense. But that's my name, and I belong to the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation. And the Mohawk Nation is part of a larger group called the Haudenosaunee. Uh, the French would say Iroquois, and the English they say Six Nations. The Mohawk is one of those nations. But uh, this summer, if you get a chance, if you're in the area, go a mile this way towards the east and you'll find our little museum. <coughs> or we now call it a cultural center. We've recently become a not-for-profit, and we have big plans on expanding and actually moving the building to a new location, um, installing all of new technologies and new exhibits, and so it's a very exciting time for our family and uh, hopefully for this community and our community of Akwazasana. There's a lot of things going on, and when the station opened up, it was, we were talking, it was talking to Echo, and the idea is almost like to make it an art mecca. You know, just a place where any artist can show up. And even yesterday when we were hanging the show, there was a uh, young lady, uh, I think her name was Randy, just kind of, oh, she's over there. She just showed up and she's, uh, I just checked out her Instagram page, an awesome sculpture work. But she does artists in residencies all over the place. And it's, it's just like she fell out of the sky and came in to help me. <laughs> <laughs> but I totally appreciated the help and another artist's uh, viewpoint to set up the show. So, that's the idea of this place, that you attract other artists, other people, musicians, poets. Um, and it's a, hopefully this, the years to come, you know, just grow and expand. But today, I want to talk about this painting in particular. Um, I think it was about a year ago, maybe a little more, when I was approached by uh, Carol Boslin, who lives at the end of this road. And she, at the time, was director of Blue Seed Studio. And they were applying for a grant through the uh, Lake Champlain Basin Society to do uh, get a series of uh, artworks by different artists to talk about and talk about the pollution that affects Lake Champlain through art and also combine science with that. And right away I'm like, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> so they contacted Kurt Steger. Where is he? So over there, he's in the back. <laughs> he's, he's a teaches at Paul Smith College, and I've known Kurt for a number of years. And great guy, and he knows science. And so we had a series of uh, meetings, and all virtual, of course. And how are we going to proceed? And so when this process began, I immediately thought of water, of course. And it, it brought me back to when I was a little kid, and me and my dad would walk in the woods behind our house and there was a little brook that would go through and it's kind of got a negative name. It's called the Negro Brook. It, it was another word they used before that. And I often wondered why they call it that. But there used to be a camp from the Underground Railroad not far from here. And these are all the railroad tracks would go through and there were slaves escaping the south would camp out. And they actually wanted to start a community. I think it was in Vermontville. And I know Kurt, he's been doing a little research on that. And there's also some mountains and hills that, were, that have the N-word attached to it. And so that's just a little bit of the history. But in that brook, I, oh, I'll never forget it. I, I like to make little bolts and little sticks and see if they float. And I remember I threw a stick in there and he watched it float down the brook. And my dad looked at me and goes, you know, that'll end up in Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately that'll end up in the ocean. 
It was like, you know, profound, you know, I was like, really? <laughs> but yep, you just follow it and it goes, empties into the Saranac River. The Saranac River goes to the Lake Champlain and then it's the Rishalu, to the St. Lawrence, to the ocean. Hmm. But that thought and that memory immediately popped in my head. And the idea is that what we touch as human beings, what we manipulate, what we discard, goes somewhere else. Someone else has to deal with it. Maybe not now, maybe in the future. It's just like that little brook, you throw garbage or pollutants into that water, it goes somewhere else, and it will affect others. And so with that notion, that's when I came up with this idea. <laughs> and also during our discussions, in our meetings, uh, there was a concept of uh, a Native American, specifically the Haudenosaunee, called the Thanksgiving Address. And um, in Mohawk, they say, And that means the words that come before all else. The concept is simple. Whenever there's a gathering of people, we probably should have done this before, but in our own language, we say these words to acknowledge every aspect of creation, every part. And we gather our minds as one, in one voice, we offer thanks to those things. Because you take one of those elements, one of those things away, we're not here. It affects the balance of everything. And it starts out with the earth that we call our mother. And that's why I chose a female. Because the earth, you've heard that phrase, Mother Earth, and that's a common theme among a lot of Native peoples. Your mom takes care of you. Your mom, your mom nurtures you. Your mom is probably the most powerful entity there is. She'll stand in front of anything to protect her, protect you. And so, and also the nurturing, sustenance. And that's what this earth is. It takes care of us. And so if you abuse these things, you're hurting yourself. <laughs> and so in this Thanksgiving address, you talk about everything, even the grass, the food plants, the medicine plants, the water, that brook, the ponds, the lakes, the fish that live in there, the trees, the animals, the chitam, the birds. And even this morning, I was, went out on my porch, you know, I was thinking about what I was going to say here, and I heard the most beautiful song, and it was the hermit thrush, they're back. Yeah. And it just, it's, I remember my grandfather, he told a story about it. He says, what that song does is it makes your heart grow. And it's like the sun shines, and it does. It just, it's so beautiful. <coughs> so from there, the uchita, the birds, you go up, you have the wind that freshens the air, you have your grandfathers, the thunder, or the lucky whales, that you hear. If you don't hear him, your grandfathers, you know something's wrong. You know, it dries up. And from that, you go up and you even look at the moon that we call our grandmother. The sun is our elder brother. All the stars. And all together, this whole creation, you offer thanks. But this, Ohandu Galiwadeku, the words that you say can take a long time, <laughs> depending on the speaker. Like I know some speakers just cut right to the chase, you know, <laughs> graspers and go up to get on with whatever you meant to do. And when I was a kid, there's a place they call the Longhouse, and that's where you gather for ceremonies and uh, political events, weddings, funerals. I remember this old guy got up to say these words before the business took place. It took him about an hour. And he, he talked about everything. And I remember there was, a, he even talked about, he had a barn, and behind his barn he had this water pump. That, you know, those old pumps. And he talked at length about that, you know, because he was thankful for it. And so, it can range from a short amount of time to a long time. But these words are always spoken at every gathering. So I just gave you a little version of it in English. But they usually do it in our language. For every part, when they say we can now gather our minds as one and say thank you, the whole, all the people say something in agreement, or they say to, or they agree. So with that in mind, we were talking as artists, you know, how do we produce art to reflect this? And that was originally what I was going to do. 
I was going to have all aspects of creation in this painting. <clears throat> but then I narrowed my focus to water. In El Mark, they say Onegonos. And uh, Onegonos, you, you don't have water, you're done. You wouldn't last how long? Two days? And I'm worried about the West. You know, you see these reservoirs are disappearing. Drought's been going on. You know, speak with Echo and Melissa. They, they lived out there. The fire. There's a shift happening. And the science can back it up. And there's one scientist over here that has a book about it. <laughs> and it's true. You know, I'm not a scientist, but I, I like Kurt and I trust him. So I'll listen to him. It's happening. You know, the native people in the north, the Inuit, they're seeing changes where the ice is melting, the permafrost. And what that does is it releases more carbon because all of the vegetation that's permanently frozen thaws out and it starts to rot and all those, that carbon goes into the sky. <clears throat> so we got a lot of things to worry about, but we have a lot of things to be thankful for. And so there's like that balance. And so with this image, if you look closer after, you get a good view of it. This is a style that I call a mosaic. And you see I have two other uh, examples here. And I started that style a number of years ago. It was just by accident. I was experimenting. And you know, I do a lot of figure painting and portraits. And I got kind of bored with it. I just want to try something different. And I had recently finished uh, illustrating a book. And of course, everything is smaller. You know, you got to do a fine detail. And I wanted to paint something big. And so I got a big canvas about this size. And I really didn't know what I was going to paint. And so I'm thinking I set up some lights and had my camera and took a couple selfies and adjusting the lights. And then I, I opened my mouth like I was screaming. And anyways, I'm looking at my computer and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And so I decided I was going to paint that one with the mouth wide open. It's like screaming. So I did a rough outline of, you know, just like a regular painting. And then I, mm, I did a monochromatic. I didn't like that. And then I got thinking, I want a painting you can hear. You know, something that you look at and you want to hear it. And so, <coughs> using the, like an idea of pointillism, like dabs of paint, I started from the mouth, where the voice is coming from. Small, real small, then as it exploded outwards, the paint got bigger. The paint dabs got bigger, and I'm like, wow, that's cool. And I liked it. I liked how it was turning out. And I said, what if I went and painted every one of them? And I took a different color paint, and served with a dab, and I put a, a little Haudenosaunee design in it. And I did another one, did another one. It took me about two hours to do a little area this big. And I looked at it, and I was like, hmm, I'm onto something here. <laughs> and then I looked at the whole canvas, and I was like, oh my gosh. It's going to take, <laughs> <laughs> take a while. And so just being, just patience. And I worked on it every day. It didn't turn on the television. I didn't get on Facebook too much. But uh, just work. And I, believe it or not, my favorite music to listen to as I paint is Bach. It's got to be the violin or cello. I like blues, reggae, I like all music, but th that type of music I end up dancing. And I'm not painting. <laughs> but Bach, for some reason, it just puts me in the right frame of mind. And uh, I, I listen to it for hours. And so as I did that first mosaic, and as it was taking shape, and I finished it, I sold it right away. And so I was like, oh, cool. And so I started just doing others, and I've, I've been commissioned to do a few. And when you look at these mosaics, and you look at all the intricacies, the designs, the vast majority of the designs are reflective of my culture. You know, whether it be uh, wampum belt, beadwork design, quill work, um, even pottery, etchings, uh, different symbolism, pictographs that are incorporated into these mosaics. But you run out of ideas after a while. And one day, on my first mosaic I was working on, I was driving down State Road, or Hogansburg, at Akwazasne, and there was a good friend of mine, Joe Barnes. He always told me, stop by my place. He had a little store. And he goes, I'll show you my Star Wars collection. And so I was like, <laughs> finally that day came, I was like, oh, I'll just pull in. And, hey, Joe, what's going on? And he goes, come back here. It was in the back room. Unbelievable. <laughs> row after row, shelf after shelf. 
Star Wars uh, memorabilia, toys, lunch boxes, lightsabers, soda, Yoda, that's their favorite. He was a collector. He collected for years. He was always on eBay looking. And, uh, it was like a museum. It was unreal. And I was looking at that and had a nice visit with him. And he passed away. He was uh, pretty young in his 40s. He passed away. But that day, when I looked at all that Star Wars stuff, I went home working on that mosaic. I had Star Wars on my mind. And so I just said, oh, Darth Vader. I put Darth Vader in there. Went to another area, that little stormtrooper. So from that point on, every mosaic I do, there's Star Wars in there. <laughs> and I challenge you to find them. <laughs> and at our museum, when there's a, you know, a lot of people, I mean, some kids don't like museums, and you know, they get uh, anxious or whatever, and bored, and they say, go find Darth Vader. Yeah. An hour later, they're still there. <laughs> okay, calm down. Yeah. But anyways, this painting is the first one I did that's kind of a blending of two styles. You have to figure, you paint this part, and then you have the foliage is all mosaic. And I do have Star Wars in here, but I also have scientific data that reflects the pollution that ends up in Lake Champlain. Talking with Kurt, and uh, <clears throat> he sent me some images of different uh, molecules of uh, I think it's phosphorus, phosphates, nitrogen. Um, there's even salt, the road salt. You know, that stuff washes away and it ends up in the waters. And it, too much of it can be poisonous. You know, not just us, other things as well. <laughs> so hidden in here, I had a hard time finding them again. Because <laughs> I forgot where I put them. But there's a... Uh, I think there's a nitrogen down here, and also the different algae that form. And uh, the phosphorus and the phosphates feed all the algae, and those blooms become toxic. But when you look at them under a microscope, they're beautiful. <laughs> it's hard to believe that such a beautiful thing can cause so much damage, kill the fish, you know, you could get sick. There's one down here, I'd have to find it, but it, there's these little little dots, but they're encased in this, it looks like glass. Very in interesting looking, and so I had a challenge of painting that. There's a cyanobacteria, another algae bloom up in here, so I had to challenge you to find it. <laughs> but uh, so I wanted to incorporate the science with the philosophy that we have. The no-brainer is don't throw your garbage and your pollution into the water. We've known that for thousands of years. <laughs> In fact, in our territories, when we had a village, they had their gardens for about a generation. And then they'd move, clear another area, and start a new town with the same people so that that land can replenish. You don't overuse it. You know, it's, you take care of it too for the future. Then you start another town. And that's why my brother's name, my older brother, his name is Tehonada. And that name means he has two talents, and that's where that comes from. Yeah. And so it's the idea that you nurture, you take care of the land, and she'll take care of you. But um, I'm trying to think of anything else I want to talk. But, but when you look at this painting, in my, what I wanted to put out there is that the idea of our hands as humans, what we do, what we touch, has consequences. Sometimes it's good. We do amazing, wonderful things but we also do harmful things. So as an artist, I want to put forth that notion about how important that water is. And again, the folks out west, they're feeling that pain right now. And they might come here, I don't know, unless we do something. You know, it's up to us as individuals, it's up to us collectively as people to do something different, to help keep things the way they should. I guess I can open it up to questions if you have any questions. Um, did you paint uh, from a particular location or is it more of a kind of a just a, not a, just a creation of what the area looks like generally or were you at a particular location? Well, I just, it was in my head. You know, I've been to Lake Champlain before, so I kind of knew what it looked like. But it could be any lake. 
Okay. You know, so it's not necessarily just Lake Champlain. Um, I did do a little research, you know, look for photographs to see, you know, different viewpoints of what it looks like. And at one point, the mountains are really little, but, you know, we're in the other so I want to make a little bigger. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea, of course, is in body water, you know. Any other questions? Um, what was going through my mind as you were talking is kind of up a commercial memory that, you know, in the past there, there was an Indian that was going across the country, across the plains, the mountains, the streams, and they came upon a place where there was a lot of trash that had been thrown oh, yeah. in. And, you know, and then he has a tear yeah. coming out. So it kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. Uh, but also, it uh, kind of reminded me of a movie that we saw recently called Dark Waters. I don't know if you've of that movie. Uh, it's about the um, uh, pollution in West Virginia that the PTFP has created, which is Teflon, which went into a lot of things. And uh, it's a really good movie. I would invite anybody to watch that if they're interested in anything of that nature. Uh, but it's, uh, it is really a an instance where, you know, they're trying to contain water in a field, and it just doesn't stay. It doesn't stay, you know, like you said. When it comes out, it affects everybody downstream. And we live on the Tennessee River, and, uh, you know, the two of us has issues, you know, we yeah. know about these issues, and people are trying to do something about it, but will they ever be able to? So. Well, this is a short sightedness of humans. It is. You know, like you know, our philosophy in most things is we always think seven generations ahead. You may have heard that term, but that's part of our culture, and uh, especially for our leadership, our loyal, uh, our chiefs. Any action that they do today, they always have to keep in mind how is it going to affect seven generations down the road. And so a lot of deliberation and thought goes into any decision. You know, say if I want to build a, I don't know, a factory, you, know, you got to keep that in mind. Like, how is this? Is this beneficial, or is it going to be damaging? So that's why it takes a long time to get anything done <laughs> yeah, because you have to think. And, uh, but where we're from, or up as us is, uh, you know, you can Google all this information. There was uh, General Motors had a, a foundry, um, Reynolds Aluminum mm -hmm. Alcoa. Mm -hmm. And on the Canadian side was uh, Howard Smith Pulp Mill, all to the west of our territory. So all that pollution in the air goes east. And in the 80s, 90s, even now, we're still fighting to get them to clean it up. You know, General Motors is closed. They just want to put a cover on it. And they found a dump there that was uh, loaded with PCBs. Uh, there was a, in the early 80s or mid 80s, there was a turtle they found dead in the went down and he examined it, did samples, and it was uh, 300 times what's considered toxic was in that turtle. And turtles are in the water. It was in the water. It appeared in women's breast milk on the reservation. And I remember as a kid, geez, I must have been seven or eight years old, there's a place uh, on Racket Point where a man had a, an area, and there was a little, right on the St. Lawrence, and there was a little, like, a bay that was right on the edge of the territory, and it was still water, because the, the river is swift. You know, you, it can take you away. But this one spot was where all the kids would swim. And of course, I swam, and we all went, and we were swimming in that. And I remember my older brother grabbed me by the scruff, pulled me out, and he goes, get out of there, get out of there. And I'm like, what? And he's pointed across, and I looked across. There's these guys up on the hill uh, with contamination suits. And, uh, we were swimming in that muck, and uh, that's when they found out it was a dump. They were illegally dumping all that pollution, you know, swimming in it. And a lot of kids were swimming in it. Uh, we were still getting advisories where you can't eat the fish. Maybe one a month, isn't it? Maybe one a month. You can't sustain yourself. You know, our grandparents, our elders, would eat fish. It was a uh, food source that was right out there. <clears throat> it was healthy. It was good for you. Now that we can't eat fish, diabetes is through the roof. Because you, you have to eat. You eat this processed stuff that's loaded with sugar. And our bodies are starting adapted for that. And so that's the water. 
um, drinking water. Where my mother lives and where we live now is a place called Gavanoga or Cornwall Island. And they put the seaway through and they dredged the, so the big ships could go through. That messed up the natural springs. And so now that you have a well, it smells like sulfur, it stinks. But you go into everybody's house, it smells like rotten eggs. It gets all the stuff on your faucet. But now they have a water line. But for I never liked taking showers at my grandmother's because his hair felt sticky, you know. But and that's what happens. What what humans can do, you know. But there's we also can fix it. So I'll have to check out that movie. Yeah, absolutely. And that, there's other stories across the country about you know like that, you know with fracking, hydro fracking, and you know those videos of people put a lighter to their water and it, poof, <laughs> pretty crazy. And that's why, well, the, I call this painting, um, Water is Life, because it is. And that, that term came about a number of years ago <clears throat> when there was protests about that uh, standard rock uh, they were putting in a pipeline. And they had originally had this pipeline going through Bismarck, non-Native American community, and they, they got upset. Because what if there's a spill? He says, well, okay, we'll go down south. So they went through Standard Rock, Indian land. Of course, the native people there said, no, it was going to go under a river. So what if it busts and that oil goes into the water? That's our water. Peaceful protest. Not just native people, but young people from all across the country came to this camp at Standard Rock. Protest, and of course, they brought the police and they looked more like the military than the police. And uh, one young lady, her arm was almost blown off from a uh, stun grenade, uh, rubber bullets. I know of young people that went there. And, uh, and so that's the fight. Um, north, uh, or New Brunswick, in that area, the Nickmap, uh, they started seeing these trucks going in near their territory where they're testing for hydrofracking. They do that seismic test. And so they protested, blocked the road. And then it shows these images of these, uh, they call them police, but they're like military. Mm -hmm. Backed out with helmets, camel. And one guy, had, he was laying down, he had a sniper rifle, big scope. He was ready to kill. And these are native people with no weapons, just protesting. And so that's how powerful the, the, these companies are. You know? And the thing is, is that all these things are doing is just perpetuating the damage. You know, it's just going to keep going. But as young people, I have hope for that they're going to stand up. And if you have the right to vote, vote for vote well. <laughs> and vote whoever's in office out. <laughs> That's right. They're all corporate control. Yeah. I still say they should adopt our way of government because in our system, the women nominate men to be chiefs. <laughs> and they can also impeach them, too. <laughs> I have two questions, one that's really broad, uh, how you began painting, uh, kind of like that more narrative history of how you came to painting and how it sort of developed. And then my second question is this combination between like the realism of this painting and the abstract mosaics, like what, what that combination now, since that sort of new is like doing for you or where you, where you feel like that's going. How did I start painting? Like in the beginning, beginning? Beginning, beginning. Well, talking about Genesis. You can ask my mom. My mom's over here. <laughs> <laughs> she moved the she moved the couch, and she looked around and she saw uh, there was a sofa, those sectionals that we we had in our living room, and there was the corner one. It was the curve, and I I could jump in there as a kid, and I went in there and I had pencils and pens. And, <laughs> <laughs> started drawing old caveman art on the walls and all. But then she was cleaning it and she landed, oh my god. <laughs> and so rather than you know yelling at me, she got me a little desk and you know, art supplies and from now on. And then eventually I was like, Can I paint the walls? I said, sure. You know, it just in your bedroom, not in the living room. And so I did murals in uh, my bedroom and uh, that's how I started. And uh, of course my dad he was uh, an art teacher, and he's illustrated, uh, I think, over 90 books in his career. Uh, if you go to the museum, you see all the work my grandfather did. 
We did pictograph writing, uh, beadwork. Um, my grandmother from Illinois, and she's a basket maker. My grandfather made lacrosse sticks. Everyone did something. So I had that inspiration all the time. And courage, just keep doing it. And then uh, I think maybe 10% is talent, and the rest is just work. You have to work at it. You know, I wasn't born painting like this. You experiment, and that goes to another other question is that I always love faces and the challenge of painting faces because it's hard. You know, it's very difficult to create an image that uh, another a viewer can look at and recognize as a human. <laughs> Some of my earlier paintings, which you'll never see, <laughs> were horrible. I look at, I thought it was great then, and I look at them now. Oh. And also, I have an aunt too. She's an art teacher, and she gave me a few tips on how to paint. And it just kept at it, kept working, working, and experimenting. And as far as the style, I just grow. You experiment, you try new things. And uh, you know, I go to museums and study other artists. And just, you get inspired by different techniques. And also, you get bored. <laughs> you want to do something new. And, you know, at one point, I really got into using a palette without using a brush. You just use real thick dabs of paint and you just, you know, see if it works. And the first few times it was horrible. <laughs> it turned into mud, you know, like awful. But then I just, I read up on it, learned more. Uh, but I always liked the figure, you know, the human form, the human shape. Studied anatomy. In a lot of my earlier paintings, you'll notice that they all have long hair covering their ears. His ears are really tough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you look at an ear, it's kind of a weird looking thing. <laughs> but we all have them. And we all listen. So I, I studied that. Uh, hands, the other thing. You know, a lot, of my, a lot of my earlier work, the hands just look unreal. And, you know, they're uh, too big or too small. <laughs> you know, uh, foreshortening. You know, you, you know, you have a hand like this, it's easy to draw, but you turn it, different shapes, different, I mean, it's so complex, and so that took a while, and I'm still learning. Um, you learn until you're done. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> Any other questions? How many hours does something like that take you? Many. <laughs> oh, I could imagine. On average, like a, a mosaic about this size, about four months. And that's working just about every day. Mm -hmm. um, take a day off here and there. And it, I only do uh, two hours at a time. Um, one time I, I was over three hours. I was almost done. I wanted to finish. And I was painting, 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 painting. And it was over three hours. And finally, I was starting to make mistakes. And I, yeah. I got to stop. Then I looked around. And I'm at, I couldn't focus. My mm -hmm. eyes couldn't focus. Because I was there for three hours. Right. So I cut it to two. <laughs> About four months. Any other questions? Are they for sale? Yeah, I don't have any prices yet. These are all my COVID paintings. Uh, <laughs> some of them aren't signed yet. They're not done. Uh, but yeah, I, I just haven't thought of prices or anything. But when COVID hit, you know, we got laid off, went home, and all the time in the world. You know, I, painted, I think I did over 24 paintings. Wow. Yeah. You know, some are small, some are bigger. I just haven't compiled a, a list yet. Uh, I've just been enjoying painting. And, you know, there haven't been many art shows, you know, per se, but it's starting to pick up. So. Any other questions? No? Well, look around and thank you all for this. Thing. <laughs> They want to buy something, how to reach you. Oh, yeah, well, get my business card. Yeah, I'm not a businessman, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need an agent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>